Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome all Pennsylvania listeners, pediatricians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, practice managers, office staff, and others to Let's Talk Environmental Health, the Potential Health Impact of Natural Gas Drilling with Hydraulic Fracturing. I'm Dr. Jamie Calabrese, the President of the Pennsylvania Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Today's webinar and telephone conference is provided through the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. This webinar will be recorded. It will be available on Dr. Paulson's Children's National Medical Center website. The PA chapter will post on our website the link to that website to make it easier for everyone to find. To meet CME requirements, please be advised that both Dr. Paulson and I have no disclosures to report. Please note that the information presented in this teleconference is educational in nature and does not necessarily represent the views or policies of the PA chapter of the AAP or the funder of the teleconference. For those of you listening by phone only, the speaker handouts for this teleconference and the CME evaluation form were emailed to you. If for some reason you did not receive the handouts, please notify the PA AAP office and we will email you a copy. It's also available on our website. The format for today's call is Dr. Paulson will present his talk for approximately 45 minutes. For those of you participating via webinar, you are able to post your questions via the chat feature throughout the presentation. For those of you participating by phone only, we will have a designated time to open the lines for a live Q&A session. Now let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Jerome Paulson is Associate Research Professor of Pediatrics and Public Health at the George Washington University. Director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, a director in the Child Health Advocacy Institute at the Children's National Medical Center, a member of the Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee for the EPA, and chair of the Executive Committee of the AAP Council on Environmental Health. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Paulson, please go ahead and begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for that kind introduction. Thank you also for inviting me to make this presentation to the Pennsylvania chapter of the AAP. Um, on the second slide, um, you will see that the Mid-Atlantic Center um, is partly funded by the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry and um, the EPA, but they are not responsible, nor do they review the contents of this presentation. I have in the past provided some factual information to lawyers regarding the potential health impacts of natural gas extraction with hydraulic fracturing. Slide four. Um, in terms of our objectives for this afternoon, um, I hope that you will be able to describe the process of natural gas extraction with hydraulic fracturing, describe some of the toxicants that are associated with this process, and be able to list and understand potential ha health hazards, um, particularly for children, that are associated with this process. So next slide. Um, in terms of natural gas extraction with hydraulic fracturing, there are seven or eight steps from total from the very beginning to uh, the uh, very end of this process. Um, they have to construct uh, an area called a pad um, and the roads that, that lead to the pad. They set up a drill. Um, they do their drilling. Then um, once the drilling is complete, the um, rock underneath the ground is fractured. Sometimes it's also called fracking. The natural gas is extracted, and then um, months or years later, uh, when all of the gas is extracted, uh, the well is decommissioned, and the notion is that then the land um, is restored. Now, in Pennsylvania in particular, this process has not been going on long enough um, for there uh, to have been any uh, decommissioning or land restoration uh, of the current shale gas wells, of course, you have a long history of oil extraction um, and other natural gas extraction uh, in Pennsylvania. Next slide. So here you see um, an image taken from the air um, of what a 
uh, pad looks like in the early part of uh, its construction. They've removed the trees. Um, in this case, uh, it was done in the middle of a farm field, so they've removed that ground cover. Otherwise, they would be removing the trees, leveled the site, and then along the um, left-hand side of the image there um, where you see the flat area of the pad, you will see a depression in the ground, and um, that's called an impoundment pond, and we'll come in back and talk to talk about the importance of impoundment ponds uh, later on. And then on the next slide, you see um, how the pad has actually been set up. Um, with the drill rig in the center of the pound, uh, center of the pad, um, the wastewater impoundment now is uh, starting to collect some water that's in the lower left-hand corner of the image. And then also on the pad, you have some prefabricated um, offices that are uh, on trailers that have been trucked in. Um, you have diesel generators, waste recycling containers, and sand and chemical storage. So this is now basically um, an industrial site that has been set up in this particular instance um, in the middle of a farm field. In other instances, it might be in the woods. And in Texas, um, in particular, sometimes uh, these sites are set up in the middle of cities. And um, it's not just one particular um, well site. In order for natural gas to be extracted from the shale rock um, and for that to be done effectively, you have to set up multiple pads that are relatively close to one another. So on slide eight, um, you see um, an area um, a Google photograph, a uh, Google Earth photograph uh, from Washington County, Pennsylvania, before um, any uh, natural gas extraction pads were set up. And then um, that same uh, part of Washington County, Pennsylvania, um, a few years later, after four particular pads have been set up, and you can also see um, the interconnecting roads that have been set up to service these pads. Um, and then um, this is another um, uh, image that is taken of a drill pad. And one of the other one of the things that you can see from this particular image now on slide nine um, is how close these pads are to homes and the relative size of these pads to the home. So that um, if there's a leak, um, the material does not have very far to go. Um, there is noise and sometimes um, uh, nighttime lights um, from the pads. And so the homes are close enough that they um, are impacted by the noise and those uh, lights. So once the pad has been set up and the drill is erected, then the hole uh, into the ground is drilled. This involves some fluid. Um, this is not yet the so-called fracking fluid that you've read a lot about in newspapers or seen in news reports. This is um, drilling fluid that is basically used to lubricate the drill bit as it goes through um, the rock and the ground um, underneath the drill pad. The drilling fluids um, can, in and of themselves, contain some toxic materials. And then um, as the drill fluid comes back up from the hole, um, it contains those materials as well as materials that have been dissolved by the fluid from their storage sites in the rocks underneath the ground. Now, the drilling fluid, unless there's an explosion, by and large um, doesn't represent much of a public health risk because if things go according to plan, um, it does not get off of the pad site itself. 
Of course, if there is an explosion, then there can be wide dispersal of the um, drilling uh, material. And that drilling material is often stored basically um, just buried underneath the ground um, when the drill pad is decommissioned. And so it does present a long-term risk um, depending upon how that pad site might be used in the future. Um, the material can be um, moved by rain or floods or if somebody goes and builds on that pad site and um, uncovers uh, the drilling fluid with its contaminants, um, again, that, that does uh, present some potential public health risk. And then I want you to study this slide number 11 um, fairly closely because everything that I say from here on out is going to depend on some understanding of this image. So in the center of the image, you see where the drill hole goes underground. And I want you to look at where the water table is that's only usually a few hundred feet underground. And then the shale rock that can be anywhere from five to 10,000 feet underground. But the well, of course, has to get all the way down to that level. And then one of the things that is very different and new in terms of natural gas extraction with fracking as used in Pennsylvania and in other places where there is shale gas, you can see where the drill hole turns, and in this one example goes to the right, but in real life, there are drill holes that go right, left, forward, backward. Um, and in, so in, if you were to look at this from above, it would be looking um, at a daisy um, with multiple drill holes going out um, in all directions around the, the daisy or the clock face, if you will. Once the um, drill hole is made, then fluid, which has to be brought by multiple tanker trucks, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes, and mixed on site with sand and a number of other chemicals, is pumped down um, uh, underground. And then you can see at the end of um, that well hole where the uh, fractures are made in the shale rock. Think of a shale rock as um, a sponge, except that it's rock. And each of the little cavities in the sponge is where the gas is. So if, if you just drill the hole in there, you're not going to get much gas out. But if you can crush that sponge, that rocky sponge, and break up all those little holes um, where the gas is stored, then the gas will come back. And the sand is used to prop open the cracks that have been made in the, um, in the rock. And so you will see the term propent used to describe the sand. The, some of the fluid remains underground. Some of the fluid, um, the fracking fluid now comes back above ground. It is stored in that pit. And then you can see that truck next to the pit, and sometimes um, the fluid is shipped off site and processed, and we'll come back and talk about that in some more detail. And then the natural gas comes out of the well, um, sometimes vented to the atmosphere, um, sometimes burned, then um, put into pipes and stored and distributed. And you can see that on the right-hand side of this uh, diagram. So. Let's talk now about air pollution, but air pollution that occurs even before the well um, or before the natural gas starts to come back above ground from the well. So there can be um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of um, truck trips that are required to deliver the water and the sand and the chemicals to the pad site. There are diesel generators that operate um, for electricity and to run equipment um, on the pad site. And that diesel, um, all that uh, uh, burning of diesel fuel 
um, creates uh, particulate air pollution and ozone, um, both of which can contribute to um, problems uh, with asthma and other problems as well. Going on to slide 13, so it takes anywhere from 1 to 10 million gallons of water to do a single frack job on a single well. So for calculation purposes on this slide, I've said let's say it takes 5 million gallons of water. And um, if those tanker trucks carry 3 million gallons apiece, then it's going to be almost 1,700 truckloads just to bring the water to the site. And if it takes the 1.5 million pounds of sand and they can bring in 2,000 pounds per truckload, and that's um, 750 truckloads of um, required to bring the sand in with all of its uh, attendant diesel exhaust. And this is just one well fracked one time. And if you've got um, any given well being fracked um, up to 10 times and um, dozens, if not hundreds, of wells in any given county, um, then you can see that the air pollution from the trucks and from um, the diesel generators on the pad sites can be quite extensive. And, of course, with all of these truck uh, trips, there's also um, the health risks associated with collisions um, and spills uh, from the truck trips themselves. The natural gas extraction also contributes to air pollution. So um, go on to slide 14. Natural gas is, of course, methane, so CH4. But then the, it's not um, pure methane that comes back from underground. It's methane that is maybe mixed with benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, xylene, propane, um, other chemicals, including hydrogen sulfide. Um, and in the first few days that the well produces, that gas is not captured. It is either burned off um, in a flaring process or it is just released to the atmosphere. Once they start capturing it um, in the compressors and the storage tanks and pumps and pipelines, um, those things all leak to some um, limited degree. And so, again, you get um, uh, the methane, you get these other chemicals, the hydrogen sulfide, all released um, to the air, and these contribute to local air pollution and to some other um, ex uh, concerns. Besides the, the potential to create ozone and the particulate matter that comes from uh, the diesel exhaust and the methane, uh, and methane rather, um, as uh, air pollutants, we have to think about methane as a greenhouse gas, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, there are other volatile organic compounds. Radon comes up from underground with uh, the, the gas, and then um, these other toxic chemicals that are released. So for people who are living close to these pad sites, um, all of these things contaminate the air that they breathe. The ozone um, is formed when oxides of nitrogen, which certainly can come um, from uh, the diesel exhaust, and um, volatile organic compounds, which may come from the diesel exhaust and are um, uh, contained in the gas that comes up from uh, underground, interact with sunlight, and that leads to the formation of ozone. And ozone, of course, is um, an irritant to the lungs. It basically causes a chemical burn of the lungs. Uh, it will exacerbate um, asthma in those who already have it, and at least children growing up in um, towns and cities with higher ozone levels have been shown to, in one research study, be more likely to um, uh, develop asthma de novo if they're involved in varsity athletics that, that keep them outside a lot. 
going on to number 17, um, you can see um, some of the health effects that are associated um, with um, uh, ground level ozone and particulate matter. Not all of these um, are problems for kids, in particular um, the particulate matter um, that's associated with um, complications of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, stroke, and, and myocardial infarction is, of course, an adult problem, um, but increased risks of respiratory infections, exacerbation of asthma, and then for the adults, um, emphysema and other respiratory problems, um, more rapid breathing. Um, again, kids who grow up in more polluted areas at by about 18 or 21, um, have smaller lung capacity than kids who grow up in less polluted areas. Um, not so much that they're symptomatic, but I certainly worry um, what happens over the next 40 to 60 years since we all lose some component of lung function um, as we age. And then, of course, um, all of these uh, or many of these air pollutants can just cause um, ocular and pulmonary irritation with runny eyes and runny nose and coughing and, and uh, those kinds of issues. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that comes back from underground in the, quote, natural gas, um, unquote, is benzene. Natural gas, as it comes from underground, is not pure methane. Um, it has to be purified, and uh, the benzene and the toluene and other things separated out before the methane is put into the pipelines um, to go to factories or to go to uh, homes for cooking and heating. And there are now um, some studies that have looked at um, perinatal exposure um, to benzene and child health outcomes. Now, none of these are studies that were done directly related to um, natural gas extraction, but on slide 18, um, the first study that is listed there that talks about neural tube defects and the third study that's listed there that talks about childhood leukemia were studies done in Texas looking at populations um, that live near um, uh, petroleum refineries and um, measuring benzene levels in the atmosphere there and looking at um, kids who turn up in a birth defects registry in Texas. And um, what they found was um, women who were more exposed to benzene were more likely to have kids with neural tube defects and um, in an earlier study more likely to um, have kids who subsequently developed um, leukemia. The study that looked at birth um, parameters showing that moms exposed to airborne benzene were more likely to have kids with um, uh, intrauterine growth retardation was a study done in France. The women actually wore um, uh, monitors for benzene levels um, on their bodies, and the women who had higher exposures, mostly from um, automobiles and trucks on roads near their houses, um, were more likely to have kids with smaller growth parameters than the women who were less exposed. As I mentioned before, um, these pad sites are basically industrial sites. And in the time of uh, the drilling and the natural gas extraction, um, they operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, in the early part of the effort, uh, with all the trucks coming in, they can come in um, throughout the day and night. Um, the drilling runs all the time. Um, if they have lights on the pad, there's light pollution. There certainly is um, noise pollution, and um, we know that sleep deprivation, um, noise pollution, and those sorts of things um, can contribute to stress and the attendant health effects uh, that go along with stress. When you need one to five to sometimes 10 million gallons of water to fracture that rock underground, you need to get that water from somewhere. 
And that means that either a well is drilled into the water layer underneath ground and water is pumped from there, or tank trucks go out to lakes and uh, rivers nearby and suck up the requisite uh, volume of water and bring that um, to the pad site. Well, in Pennsylvania, I don't know that water depletion um, from either groundwater or surface water has been a big problem yet, but certainly in Texas where this process is also used and where they have been having a drought for several years, um, this is a significant issue, and similar problems have developed uh, in other parts of the country just from um, the fact that this water is used and then cannot, in many instances, be reinserted into the cycle um, that goes for drinking water or irrigation water, and it's causing problems with other things that people want to do in those areas um, because now there's a lack of, of water. Then, when that water comes back above ground from the underground uh, fracturing uh, activity, look please at slide 21, um, it's stored in the pits and then um, trucked off site. In some instances, companies are moving to recycling that water and reusing it, um, but that's not very widespread yet. Um, you have all of the materials that were added to the fluid, um, and I'll come to that more specifically in a moment. But then you also have materials that were locked in the rock underground that then become dissolved and come up above ground. You have um, radioactive material, and um, you have salt. Um, of various sorts, sodium chloride, bromides, um, uh, uh, salts of manganese and um, magnesium and other things. And so when these pits overflow, as they often do with heavy rains or if a nearby river floods, um, those chemicals are um, all released. And if there is leakage um, around the well, casing where it goes through the underground aquifer, then the aquifer can be contaminated in that fashion as well. Also, when this material comes above ground, if it's not um, trucked off site, they put it in these ponds and try to get it to evaporate. So if you look at slide 22, you can see um, the size of one of these evaporating ponds, um, look at the house uh, and compare the size of the pond um, to the house. The house is downhill from that pond, so if it starts to leak, um, then it's going to um, get down to the house fairly readily. And then the other thing that I've labeled in this image um, are misters. So misters are... Um, mechanical devices, think about a nebulizer or a vaporizer, um, expanded many fold, that put this material into the air to try and get the water to evaporate. But of course, um, some of the organic chemicals are going to evaporate as well and get carried away, and even um, salts and whatnot will get aerosolized and carried away as well. So these misters can really contribute um, to the, the local contamination. Now let's talk about um, what's put into these um, fluids when they're pumped underground um, for the purpose of fracturing the rock. And what you will see from um, the advertisements in your local newspapers or on radio and television locally is that these chemicals represent um, less than 1% of the total fluid that's put underground. And that's very true. However, if every time you fracture a well, you use between 1 and 10 million gallons of fluid all told, then the volume of these toxic fluids um, does become cumulatively quite large. There is no database 
available that lets anybody know exactly what all of the chemical components are of the materials that are added to the water in the sand and pumped underground. The table that I have on slide 23 um, is some information that was collected by a congressional committee and represents only a very small part of um, the list of chemicals that were provided to the to that committee. And you can see that it involves alcohol, uh, various alcohols, of course, the silica sand quartz, um, ethylene glycol, um, sodium hydroxide, and a number of uh, other chemicals that I don't have room to list here. And if you say, okay, so we have laws in this country that are supposed to prevent water pollution and air pollution. In particular, we have the Safe Drinking Water Act um, and um, uh, the Clean Air Act. Um, why aren't the, the use of these chemicals prohibited by those um, pieces of legislation? Well, looking at slide 24, you can see a list of chemicals that are, have or are being used in the fracturing process that might have been um, uh, precluded by the Clean Air Act or the Safe Drinking Water Act, but Congress in 2005, before hydraulic fracturing became uh, extensively used in the East, and particularly in Pennsylvania, um, Congress exempted the process of natural gas extraction and hydraulic fracturing from the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And so um, we have chemicals that would otherwise be listed as hazardous air pollutants. That's uh, what the HAP stands for, chemicals that would have been controlled by um, the Safe Drinking Water Act, that's what SDWA stands for, and chemicals that um, are known carcinogens that are all being used um, in this process in um, cumulatively what comes to be fairly large volumes, then come back up above ground. Some of them are emitted into the air where they can reach human beings via the inhalation route, and some of them um, are in the water from the fracturing, which then can get into groundwater um, or surface water when the containment ponds leak or when the water is shipped off-site to processing plants that are inadequate to deal with the chemicals in the fluid. On slide 25, you will see um, a listing of this website called Frac Focus, a chemical disclosure registry. Um, this has been set up by um, the drilling and energy industries um, where they claim to um, disclose the chemicals that are used, um, but in point of fact, um, it is not a total disclosure of all of the makeup of the chemicals that are used in um, hydraulic fracturing fluid. So um, go on to slide 26. You put water down, you put sand down, you put a number of other chemicals into that water and sand and put that down into the drill hole. And some of that stays underground, some of it comes back up above ground. Um, materials that are normally stored in the rock also come back up with that returned fracturing fluid. So you have um, various um, salts, like I said before, chlorides and bromides. You have um, radioactive material, radon, some small amounts of strontium, some small amounts of uranium, um, and you have um, heavy metals such as lead and arsenic that were in that rock underground and then get um, dissolved and come back above ground. In um, both Pennsylvania and in um, Parker County, Texas, there have been very clear, well-documented episodes of um, the migration of natural gas 
into drinking water supplies. Um, there are many, many hundreds, if not thousands, of anecdotal um, complaints about the migration of natural gas uh, into drinking water. But clearly in Dymock, Pennsylvania, and Parker County, Texas, um, very uh, extensive documentation. Now, on um, slide 28, you will also see some research that was done in, the results of some research that was done in Pennsylvania by researchers from Duke University. They um, sampled um, groundwater wells, which again usually go down several hundred to maybe at most a thousand feet. The shale rock is somewhere between five and ten thousand feet underground. And so the question is, how can you conceive of natural gas getting from five to ten thousand feet underground into the water layer, which may at most be a thousand feet underground? And that actually, the answers to the exact pathway isn't very clear. The indication that is occurring, um, as I say, is well documented in some instances, and this research um, goes as follows. So um, if you look at the x-axis, that's distance to the nearest natural gas well for the water well that has been sampled. And on the y-axis is the methane concentration in um, those wells. And what you can see in this graph is that clearly the closer um, a water well is to a natural gas well, the more likely it is to have natural gas in it, sometimes, but not always, um, at very high level levels. And the other thing that we know is that, you know, when an animal dies um, and, uh, you know, its body uh, uh, disintegrates, of course, some methane is going to be uh, released from that. When leaves deteriorate in the forest, some methane is going to be released from that. And that's, those, that kind of methane can get into groundwater and, and contaminate wells also. But the other thing that these researchers did is by carbon dating of the methane and looking at the isotopes of carbon in the methane, they can tell whether the methane that they were looking at was made, um, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago or made more recently. And in particular, um, the methane that they were seeing in this research was methane that was made eons ago and likely to be from the shale layer rather than a more superficial source of methane. Looking at slide 29, this was some research done by folks at the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health. They did not have a way of looking at the material that was trucked from the frac sites to um, the um, treatment, um, uh, water treatment centers. So what they did was that they got the water that was coming out after it had supposedly been treated. And what they found were um, a number of elements in that water that almost certainly came up uh, with the frac fluid from underground, um, and they even found some of the um, BTEX chemicals that I mentioned before and um, some butoxyethanol. So the point here is that um, these wastewater treatment plants in many instances are not designed to manage this kind of fluid, and in um, since this research was done um, in Pennsylvania, there has been some limitation um, on sending this uh, water to some of these wastewater treatment plants, but elsewhere in the country it's still going on and, um, and it's not completely ended even in Pennsylvania. One of the reasons that we're so interested in methane is, as you all well know, we um, need a, a source of energy in this country, and we would prefer to have a source of energy that came from the United States as opposed, as opposed to from overseas. And as it happens, the other thing that's important is when you burn methane, it releases um, less carbon dioxide than when you burn an equivalent amount of coal or um, oil to produce energy. 
So methane has been touted as a way of decreasing greenhouse gases and therefore um, decreasing the potential problems that are going to come from climate change um, if we can switch and use less oil and less coal. Well, that's true if you only look at the burning of methane, the burning of coal, and the burning of oil. However, um, uh, Dr. Ingrafia, who's a, an engineer from Cornell, has looked at methane as a greenhouse gas in its own right, and the release of methane from the wells before it is captured in the um, transmission system. And if you look at that, the um, methane as a system for generating energy may actually create more greenhouse gas than does um, coal or oil as a system for um, generating energy. Methane is somewhere between three and 30 times as potent a greenhouse gas as is carbon dioxide. Um, and during that initial few days, several millions of cubic feet of methane can be released per day to the air. Um, and that, of course, does not occur with um, coal mining or um, oil extraction. So um, methane may not be the panacea that we're looking for in terms of um, decreasing the problems with climate change. We're pediatricians and health professionals um, interested in kids um, on this call. Um, what are the special things that we need to think about in terms of children in the context of this whole issue? Um, looking at slide 32, um, we know that kids have vulnerable periods of development, both in terms of what goes on in utero as well as what occurs after they're born. And kids just plain old live longer than adults do. Um, what that means is, you know, if if I as a, an adult get exposed to something and it's going to take 40 years for the outcome to occur, um, well, you know, as old as I am, you can't see me, so I won't go into the details, but as old as I am, trust me, I hope I'm around 40 years from now. But a kid's going to be around 40 years from now. Kids eat more food, drink more water, breathe more air per unit of body weight than an adult does. So if the, particularly in this case, the water that they drink or the air that they breathe is contaminated, they actually get um, more, a uh, higher dose of that contaminant than um, an adult does. And their detoxifying mechanisms are different than an adult and may not protect them uh, as well as an adult's detoxifying mechanisms in terms of um, uh, liver and, and kidney metabolism and things like that. The Mid-Atlantic Center is one of 10 pediatric environmental health specialty units around the country. And we have, we meaning all of the pediatric environmental health specialty units, have developed some fact sheets on natural gas extraction and hydraulic fracturing. On slide 33, you can see a screenshot of that. If you go to www.pehsu.net, um, you can find those fact sheets both for yourselves and for your um, patients, and these are free and not copyrighted, and we encourage you to um, download them and use them extensively. This is not just an issue in Pennsylvania. If you look at slide 35, you will see a map of the United States that shows other parts of the country um, where these shale gas plays exist. Um, and so this is, this is an issue for pediatricians and health professionals in about 30 states in the United States. And it's also um, an international problem because uh, I've gotten an email from Australia a couple of days ago. People are doing this in Great Britain. Um, natural gas extraction with hydraulic fracturing has been banned in France. So it's, it's an extensive problem. Um, so in conclusion, on slide 36, while I can certainly uh, say there is no data to document that there are actually widespread adverse human health consequences occurring as a result of natural gas 
production utilizing hydraulic fracturing. Um, it is a process that leads me to great concern. There are a number of hazardous chemicals used in and produced by the fracking process and um, the natural, so-called natural gas itself um, has its own um, toxic properties. There are a number of very plausible and in some cases documented routes of human exposure through air and water. So I think it's incumbent upon the drilling and energy companies to demonstrate that they can do this process in a way that minimizes the threat to human health, and they have not um, done that. They should be responsible for revealing the full description of all chemicals used and the quantities that are used, and it should not be the responsibility of the general public to fund research to determine whether hydraulic fracturing and natural gas recovery from shale gas is dangerous after the fact. We've done that many, many times in other issues in this country, and um, we need to do it differently going forward. Let me just spend the last two minutes or so talking about the Mid-Atlantic Center itself. Um, we are a resource for you all, not only as it relates to natural gas extraction, but to all other um, environmental health hazards. Um, so um, you can turn to Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Units. We serve Region 3 that includes Pennsylvania, um, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Basically, we serve to educate um, anybody about any child's, children's environmental health topic. Um, we also have a toll-free phone number and um, an email address, and anybody um, in the region can contact us and ask any question that they want to ask um, about an environmental health issue. On slide 41, um, you can see um, a list of um, the types of questions that we deal with. This is not an exhaustive list. There are other things that we deal with as well, but these are some of the things that people have contacted us about. As I mentioned, we are um, we get our money from the Association of Occupational and Environmental Clinics, and they in turn get their money to support us from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is part of the CDC, and from um, EPA. Um, if you end up um, going somewhere else in the country, uh, you can see on slide 43, there are other pediatric environmental health specialty units um, elsewhere um, in the United States, and we all do basically the same thing. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Center um, has one foot um, here at Children's National Medical Center, another foot um, at CHOP in Philadelphia, um, but again, we serve that whole five-state region. I'm involved, Kevin Osterhout, um, who's at CHOP, is involved, and Lauren Gordon um, is our coordinator. And um, we have, again, on the last slide, a toll-free phone number um, and email address and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions um, that the group has um, on this particular topic. So I think we've got about a good 10 minutes or so uh, for questions, and I thank you uh, very much. Um, I, I need you all to talk louder, please. I have a question. All right, one at a time, please. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you from everyone asking the question. Um, if I could just ask you all to stop for just a second.
Um, I've, I've gotten one um, question via email, which is uh, the best way. Um, so the question that was asked was, what steps would you advise residents cl in close proximity to a well to take to reduce potential exposure? Unfortunately, um, you know, this is not, not something that individuals um, can do. Um, the, if, if there is water contamination, um, then it is, it is widespread. And um, if there is air contamination, um, then it's, it's going to be widespread. That's why um, this has to be looked at from a public health perspective and the the companies need to be made to um, demonstrate that um, uh, they uh, can uh, do this in a manner that does not result um, in environmental contamination and pathways of exposure um, to human beings. Um, trying to manage this um, on a, a well by well or house by house um, basis um, is not at all going to um, be successful. Um, so I hope that answers that particular question. We had a question um, that had come in before um, today, and so I'll try and answer that. And that related to what is known about the concentrations that some of these chemicals are in humans or animals who have been exposed. And we don't really know the answer to that um, yet either. Um, there are not yet, at any rate, any um, organized um, health surveys. Um, uh, there have been discussions about how best to um, go about um, doing that measuring particularly volatile organic compounds um, in human beings is um, a, a, a process that is um, not at all easy. Um, you need to be able to do this in a fashion when you know exactly what the person was exposed to, and which since the companies haven't revealed, we don't know. You need to know exactly when they were exposed relative to the time of the blood draw. The blood draw equipment needs to be special because from the, um, the tops of the tubes or the um, contents of the tubes or the syringes, there may be um, volatile organic compounds um, that are in those. And so unless you have documented all of that in advance, um, and know what you're dealing with so that um, you're not likely to have um, contamination of the equipment um, contributing to what you measure in the sample. Um, all of these things together um, make it, um, I think, relatively useless to do this on a, a random one-by-one -one patient basis and make it very difficult to even contemplate doing this um, um, on a, a research basis. Um, but there will be a meeting in Washington, D.C. in January, and we will um, spend a good bit of that meeting talking about um, how we might be able to um, go ahead and do this. Um, EPA is currently undertaking its study um, looking at um, uh, water contamination, and, and we'll have the results of that um, after a, a period of time. Um, there clearly needs to be better, um, well, there clearly needs to be research done on um, air contamination and measuring um, uh, these chemicals actually in the air, see how far away from a well site um, they can get and uh, what the concentrations might be in homes, and this is going to, would need to um, involve placement of, of air monitoring equipment. Um, it places around the pad in an organized fashion, moving out in a radial kind of fashion into homes and, and things along those lines. Um, if any of the rest of you want to um, uh, type in um, uh, a question, um, you can go ahead and uh, 
do that. Um, we can try and open the lines again, but um, uh, to, it, it, unless if, if more than one person talks, you've ground out the other person, and so I, I don't actually hear the question. So I'm hearing somebody talk about two people and a village. So if you can continue and everybody else mute your line, maybe I'll be able to hear and understand. <laughs> Okay, so I'm hearing, Lisa, you can mute the lines again, please, for a second. Um, I'm hearing uh, some questions about um, radon. Now, um, radon, of course, is, is the one thing that's relatively easy to um, test for. Um, one can go to your local um, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever, um, buy a radon test kit, um, put it in the basement for the requisite amount of time, mail it off, and um, get a result that's very reliable. There are other um, quicker ways um, um, by bringing a, a pump into the basement and, and collecting air sample for about 24 hours. Um, that needs to be done by a professional and can't be done um, by a do-it-yourself or at home. Um, and clearly, um, all of your patients should be checking their basements for radon if um, you live in a if you practice in a part of Pennsylvania where radon um, might be a problem, irrespective of the issue of um, of um, natural gas extraction and, and hydraulic fracturing, you can get very detailed local radon information by going to www.epa.gov/radon, and then that allows you um, to um, go to state-level data, county-level data, and sometimes even zip code-level um, data by working your way through those pages um, on the EPA um, website. So that's something that anybody and everybody can do. I think we are kind of coming to the end, so I want to um, ask um, uh, Lisa to please open Dr. Calabrese's um, line again and um, uh, we'll see if she has any uh, questions or anything that she needs to do to finish up uh, today's meeting. Thank you all very much. Dr. Calabrese, are you there? You need to just give me one minute. Let me unmute Oops. my line. Okay.
Remember to receive your CME or CEU credit for today's webinar. You need to complete and send your two-page evaluation form within two weeks of the call to the PA Chapter Office as designated on the form. We hope this information has been helpful. Thanks again to the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment at the Children's National Medical Center, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, and to the U.S. EPA for their funding support that made the presentation possible. Have a great rest of the day, everyone, and a happy and safe Thanksgiving.